My name is Dr. James Kennedy, and I'm the head of uh, neuroscience research at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, and also uh, head of the Brain and Therapeutics Division in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto. And I'm Candy Gogar. I'm research legal counsel at CAMH. Today, uh, we're going to be discussing the topic uh, legal considerations uh, in pharmacogenetic testing. Uh, by pharmacogenetics, I mean the uh, typically taking a saliva sample, analyzing the genes that are relevant to how the drugs work, and then providing that information back to the doctor who's going to write the prescription. Candy, I wanted to um, ask you, uh, first of all, about this potential large amount of information um, that a person has given over regarding their DNA. Uh, what are the privacy issues that arise uh, in handing over this large amount of genetic information? Mm. Well, privacy is a hot topic in research these days. Um, because of that, because there is this information that is um, given by a patient in the, with the expectation of some certain confidence and um, the potential for it to um, get out there and uh, be misused by people who weren't supposed to have the information is great. So there um, has been legislation enacted that sort of comes in and, and supports that and, and lays out what a person can and cannot do with uh, somebody's information. One of the ones is PHIPA, which is the Personal Health Information and Protection Act in Ontario. Um, there's similar legislation in uh, the other provinces and the states. But basically it says if you have information that is potentially identifiable, so if you use it on its own or it can be used with a combination of other variables to identify someone, you have to take certain steps to protect it. And so in uh, the type of research that you do in pharmacogenetics, the taking of samples and the, uh, the looking um, or stripping it down to its DNA can be potentially identifiable. And so PHIPA comes in and says, you can only use it for the purpose in which the person gave their consent. And if you then breach that, or if there is um, somehow the information gets out uh, to third parties. So for instance, um, if a insurance company wanted to um, find out if you were predisposed to certain diseases or if you have a certain um, condition, uh, they could use that information based on uh, variables that you collect and other variables that are out there to make that determination to say not enter into an insurance contract with an individual. Uh, south of the border is the um, so-called GINA legislation, the mm -hmm. Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. And I guess that's finally been put in place uh, and that would similarly uh, in the U.S. Uh, protect people from having uh, insurance companies or uh, employers who are trying to check out their employees and their future health uh, status. So there is legislation that has been proposed in Canada. It's in the bill stage right now. It's Bill S-201. Um, it was introduced in 2013. So that case where, you know, if you wanted to obtain something but uh, from someone who said you had to get genetic testing, this sort of legislation would say, that's discrimination. There is a carve-out in that legislation for medical practitioners and researchers and insurance providers who are providing very high-value insurance contracts, um, but uh, it's still in the bill stage and it's yet to be enacted. So maybe we can move on to uh, think a bit about the liability for hospitals, research institutions, and, and clinicians. Mm -hmm. um, that, uh, you know, the doctor uh, typically would order this test, um, the DNA results come back, uh, and they get uh, information about which drugs are better for this patient and which drugs are less likely to work well, and also which drugs might cause um, side effects. Mm -hmm. So it's a set of information. Uh, it's, it's not a case where the doctor would then uh, do something intrusive with the patient, uh, you know, run another whole series of tests, no biopsy involved. Mm -hmm. Rather, it's, it's uh, information uh, that helps the physician 
uh, make decisions about which of these many choices, uh, particularly in psychiatry, about uh, antidepressant or antipsychotic mm -hmm. drug to use. Yeah, so typically in a research context, um, you know, you have an intervention and um, liability is sort of attributed to that intervention. In this case, this type of research, the there isn't really no intervention in the in the sort of conventional sense. So really this information that's being given to clinicians is for clinical use. And so I, I, if there was to be third a third party claim, so a patient for instance says, you know, I was harmed because I was changed, the medication I used was changed and now um, I, 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 want to, um, I want to sue my doctor, um, you know, they could potentially sue everyone involved. But I think what is most important is a court will look at where did the negligence lie? And so if the negligence lay in the information that was given by the researcher, um, then, you know, there may be potential liability there. If the, if the negligence lay in the, cl in the clinician, who's the primary caregiver, sort of um, giving uh, or changing the prescription of someone without sort of really using good clinical judgment, potential liability may lie there. Or they may just say this is as a result of, this would have been done in sort of the standard course or the standard of care, and so um, the, there would be no liability on either of those parties. The, uh, maybe the final issue to discuss, I think, is, is uh, the ownership of DNA and the ownership of, you know, research tissue. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a, a sort of starting conversation there is the, the whole story of Henrietta Lacks, mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, decades ago, uh, tissue was obtained from her and uh, was converted into what we call HeLa cells using mm -hmm. her initials. And these cells were then um, uh, distributed by the research physicians. They were very useful, and the physicians made a lot of money on mm -hmm. selling these uh, constantly replicating cells. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so ownership is really um, an interesting case. So as the research has sort of evolved, the um, idea of who owns what has also kind of um, evolved. And uh, with Henrietta Lacks, you know, it was at a time where uh, research procedures and obtaining consent were not as um, at the forefront of researchers' minds as they are now and, and what you can and cannot do with, with uh, research. What has happened sort of um, in terms of ownership has really happened south of the border. Um, there were a few kind of key pieces that have kind of tipped the, the tipped in favor of the institution owning um, owning anything that is taken out of the body. So while you have it within you, you are the owner of it. Once it's taken out of the body, though, um, cases in the states have sort of um, said that they belong to the institution. So Moore uh, versus the Regents of the University of California was sort of the case in 1990 that said um, we that said a patient's uh, biological samples were not his property. Um, fast forward to 2000, 2003, um, there was a case, uh, Greenberg versus Miami Children's Hospital. The patient's parents um, gave consent to take cells from their children to develop a diagnostic test free of charge to be used uh, in the future. And the hospital took that and, and uh, commercialized it, so you had to pay for this, um, pay for this certain procedure. And the, um, the patients and their parents said, well, that's not what we agreed to. And the court actually found that once the tissue was removed from the individual, that um, it was now the hospitals. Um, and so they had sort of free reign to use it as, as, as they would. When it comes to you know, precise ownership, uh, I guess it's a bit more um, less clear, but, but moving in the direction of the the research institution owning the samples. Mm -hmm. Sort of in Canada, we haven't definitively answered this question. Earlier this year, there was a motion that was decided by a master who um, was looking at whether uh, cells were the property of the individual who was deceased during the case, or at the time of the hearing, 
or uh, whether it was the hospitals. And the court came back and found that cells, after they're taken out of um, an individual, actually become part of the medical record of the hospital. And so they are owned by the institution, and the institution can, can, um, can do what they want with them.